Okay, so Hello? we are live. Can you text everyone that we are live? Because for some reason I can't see the whole Zoom box. Yeah, wait, hold on. Because I muted everybody. myself. No, I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, shoot. I'm supposed to be Yes, muted. I can hear you. And we are live. <laughs> um, do you see it live? Did you clicking on that? Mm -hmm. You want me to chart? Yeah, we're live. We're live, guys. Oh, shoot. I'm supposed to be yes, and we are live. Um, do you see it live? Did you clicking on that? Okay, so um, hi everybody. Welcome to um, our presentation today. We're going to talk about rent relief options during COVID-19 and give an update on the eviction moratorium. Um, my name is Jasmine Ross. I'm here with Lisa Matosian, who um, we both work um, at the Flatbush Development Corporation. I'm actually going to start in like five five more minutes or two more minutes. So um, sorry for that pre-start, but uh, <laughs> for those who have already logged on, you guys kind of got a private taste. So we're gonna talk around 6.35, okay? Thank you. Just to give people time to log on. So if you just logged on, we're waiting like one more minute just for more people, and then we're going to start the presentation. But thank you for being early. Okay, so it is 635. Hello, everybody who has joined in. Um, and for those who are coming in, welcome. We are here with the Flatbush Development Corporation. My name is Jasmine Ross, and we're here um, to talk about rent relief options during COVID. I have been told though by the tech people that maybe I should just wait a little bit longer um, just for more people. So I apologize. Now you guys have seen two false starts, but we will be speaking soon. So for people who've just logged on, we are waiting for a few more people to come before we start, but thank you for being early. Thank you. 
Hello, for those who have just um, logged on, we're gonna start around 640, just to wait for some more people. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm really into everyone's enthusiasm right now. Um, we're just gonna wait a few more minutes, three more minutes, just to make sure that, you know, when we start, we have as many people with us as possible. Okay, so I'm going to start right now. I said, I know I said 640, but it's 638. So whatever, we're, we're rule breakers here. Um, so hi, my name is Jasmine. I'm with the Flatbush Development Corporation. Um, I'm here to present with, you know, many other people um, on rent relief options during COVID-19 and to give an eviction moratorium update. Once again, my name is Jasmine Ross. I'm here with the Flatbush Development Corporation. Um, my colleague, Lisa Matosian, is also going to be presenting today. She also works with the Flatbush Development Corporation. And we are very, very lucky to also be joined by Matt Longobardi from MFJ and Sam Yang from the Human Rights, um, the Human Rights Commission. And we are, um, they're going to give us some of their specific expertise relating to um, the various topics that they're going to present. So pretty quickly, um, with the Flatbush De Development Corporation, our address is 1616 Newkirk Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11226. We are working remotely right now. So if you really want to contact us, you should call us at 718-859-3800, extension 210. Or you can email us at housing at fdconline.org. And um, I also have Anthony here, Anthony Davis. He's another case worker at the Flatbush Development Corporation and Nina Leonard, who's helping us do the tech. So um, Lena's, Nina's gonna be working our presentation right now. So whenever you hear me say next, that is um, meant only for Nina to press next. So without further ado, Nina, can you please press next for us? Thank you. So so who we are, we are the Flatbush Development Corporation. We are an organization that provides programming and assistance for Brooklyn residents, particularly those in the Flatbush area. The corporation is divided by multiple departments, including the Youth Services Department, which runs after school programs and connects Flatbush families with resources. We have the Community Economic Development Department, which works with businesses in the Flatbush community. And we have the Housing Department, which consists of three case managers, so me, Jasmine Ross, Lisa Matosian and Anthony Davis. And um, we also have volunteers and we all together regularly meet with tenants, apply them for benefits, help them find housing and access legal resources. And we provide training to the Flatbush community on common housing issues and laws, such as the training like we're doing right now. We also um, consist of another department, which is the Flatbush Tenants Coalition, and um, they also work with tenants, but they help form um, tenant associations, you know, help start group building wide actions against landlords, and they do broader campaign work around housing laws across New York State. Um, so I want to, um, sorry, next Nina. So I wanna bring um, particular attention to the housing department's Tenant Tuesday hotline. We have a hotline every Tuesday from two to 6 p.m. Um, you know, as you can see on our flyer, we have a variety of different issues that we work with. Um, and depending on the issue, you know, there's a specific phone number. Um, but yeah, so basically we're here for the Tenant Tuesday hotline, any type of housing issues, questions you guys have, 
Um, that is what the Tenant Tuesday hotline is for. And I very much encourage anybody with a housing issue or question to call us. Um, so next, Nina. Okay, so today we are going to be covering the following. Our banner topic is the New York State Homes and Community Renewal, also known as HCR's COVID Rent Relief Program. Um, we're going to talk about how tenants can use their security deposit to pay rent arrears and current rent. We're going to talk about the eviction moratorium with Matt Longobardi from MFJ. He's going to give us an update on that. Then we're going to talk about protections under the New York City human rights law that tenants have, particularly under um, or during the pandemic. And that's going to be with Sam Yang from the Human Rights Commission. We're going to talk about um, these three state Senate bills that have been, you know, created with the Housing Justice for All and Right to Counsel Coalition and what you can do to help get it passed if you're very into what you hear. And then finally, we're going to have a question and answer session where, you know, any type of question that you have on what we covered, you can, um, you know, ask and we'll answer. So if anybody has questions during this presentation, feel free to put into the Facebook chat. We have somebody watching it and we will definitely get to those questions. Um, in terms of this presentation, we're also going to email everybody um, the presentation itself. So if we're talking too fast or saying something that sounds confusing and maybe we don't cover it in the question and answer session, no worries, you will have all of this information available to you, um, you know, at the end of the presentation. So. Um, without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to Lisa to, um, you know, actually go through the COVID rent relief program. Next. Lisa, can you unmute yourself? Sorry. <laughs> Unmuting. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, so today we're here to talk about the COVID rent relief program. Um, it's a program that's being administered by a state agency known as Homes and Community Renewal. It's going to provide eligible households with a one-time rent subsidy that will be sent directly to the landlord. Um, so it's important to note that it's just going to be a one-time payment. It's not going to be an ongoing monthly payment that you receive or that the landlord receives rather. Um, and so to apply, you have to either apply online by July 30th, 2020, or you can send in a paper application and it must be postmarked by July 30th, 2020. It's important to note that you have a very small window of time, unfortunately, to apply for this program. Um, if you are going to apply by paper application and you plan on, uh, you know, sending it in on July 30th, if you feel comfortable, I would recommend going into the post office and having them postmark the envelope July 30th. So if for whatever reason you can't apply, you know, you can only apply on the last day, not to worry, because uh, the program is not first come first serve, uh, assistance is going to be allocated based on need. And so next, you must have lost income between April 1st, 2020 and July 31st, 2020. Before March 1st, 2020, and at the time of the application, your income must be below 80% of the area median income and your rent burden must be greater than 30%. So we're gonna go through the rules right now. You're gonna hear me say terms that you may not be familiar with. We're gonna go into those terms and give examples later on in the presentation. Um, the subsidy will provide up to four months of assistance and will cover the difference in your rent burden on March 1st and the months you need assistance for. The subsidy is capped at 125% of the fair market rents. Assistance can pay back rent or if you're up to date uh, on rent, it can pay future rent or replenish your security deposit which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, if both you and your roommate are applying for assistance, you must apply together as a household. One person in the household must be a US citizen or have eligible immigration status as per the PRWORA chart. 
And lastly, you must have a residence in New York State. I just want to point something out about something that was said. So you don't need to have rent arrears to apply for this program, which I think is actually really good. You can have it applied um, to future rent or, or even to pay your security deposit back. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talked about area median income. And so first of all, what does that term mean? Um, median incomes are taken uh, for all cities across the country by a federal agency known as Housing and Urban Development. They publish AMIs on a yearly basis. And so the program is also based on AMI. Um, and it says before March 1st, 2020, and at the time of the application, the household income must have been below 80% of the area median income adjusted for household size. So um, as you can see, we have you know, the green arrow pointing to Kings County. Um, so for a household of three in Kings County, the AMI is 81,900. 80% of the AMI is 65,520. And that means a household of three must have income below 65,520 to qualify for the program. We also talked about the subsidy being capped uh, at 125% of the fair market rents. So fair market rents are also numbers that are published by HUD on a yearly basis. They are used uh, to determine voucher payment standards such as section eight. Um, and the numbers that we have at the bottom of the screen for a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom and so on, these numbers uh, are at 125% of the fair market rents. So if you have rent that exceeds these amounts, it doesn't mean that you can't qualify for the program. You can still qualify. What it means is that the subsidy will be capped at these amounts. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we also uh, mentioned rent burden. And what the program says about that is that the grant will cover the difference between an applicant's rent burden on March 1st, 2020 and their rent burden for the months they are applying for assistance. A rent burden is the amount of gross household income that you spend on the rent. So let's look at an example. Um, prior to the COVID pandemic, Tammy's monthly household income was $2,000. Her monthly rent is 700. This means that on March 1st, 2020, her rent burden was 35%. We took 700 and divided it by 2000. Today, due to a reduction in hours, her monthly income has decreased to 1400 and her rent remains the same. She is now paying 50% of her monthly income in rent, 700 divided by 1400. She is eligible for a subsidy of 15%. So how did we get 15%? We took her rent burden now of 50%. We subtracted her rent burden on March 1st, which was 35%. That gave us 15%. Then we take that and we multiply it by her income of $1,400 and we get $210. So if she qualifies for the program and she qualifies for up to four months of assistance, she's going to get $210 um, times four in a one-time payment to the landlord. Okay, so immigration status. At least one member of the household must be a United States citizen or have eligible immigration status. Under federal rules, if a household is eligible to receive assistance, one or more individuals in the household can receive benefits under Title IV of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996, known as PRWORA. You can consult the immigration status eligibility chart to determine your eligibility, and we're gonna post the links in the chat. Um, they should be posted as we're going through each slide. Um, but we will also share a, a complete list of links that we shared in this presentation in the chat box. Next slide, please. Okay, so we went through a lot of rules, right? And, and so it can be confusing because there are so many rules that apply to programs, but you know, this happens a lot of times when you're you know, applying for government programs. So let's go through the rules one more time. It's gonna be a one-time rent subsidy that will be sent directly to the landlord. Um, you can either apply online by July 30th, 2020, or by paper application, it must be postmarked by July 30th, 2020. You must have lost income between April 1st, 2020 and July 31st, 2020. 
Before March 1st, 2020, and at the time of the application, your income must be below 80% of the area median income, and your rent burden must be greater than 30%. The subsidy will provide up to four months of assistance and will cover the difference in your rent burden on March 1st and the months you're applying for assistance. The subsidy is capped at 125% of the fair market rents. Assistance can pay back rent or if you're up to date, future rent or replenish your security deposit. If both you and your roommate are applying for assistance, you must apply together as a household. Um, one person in the household must be a US citizen or have eligible immigration status as per the PRWORA chart. And lastly, you must have a residence in New York State. Next slide. Okay. So who is not eligible for the COVID rent relief program? Tenants who receive a Section 8 housing choice voucher or tenants who reside in public housing where their rent cannot be more than 30% of their income are not eligible for this program. Um, households that receive Section 8 vouchers with a rent burden that exceeds 30% of their income and or households that have lost income should request an adjustment to their rental payment contact your voucher administrator to request an interim recertification. So as we know, the administrators are um, HPD, HCR, and NYCHA. Um, I would suggest that if you're requesting a recertification that you do so in writing. Um, you always wanna have proof anytime that you're making uh, an important request to either NYCHA or to the section eight administrator. Um, you know, lots of times if you try to do things verbally, um, you know, people can forget. And, and then also you would not have proof that you actually made the request. So you always wanna have proof that you made the request um, in writing, um, you know, ideally through a stamp copy, or if you can't get a stamp copy, at least send it by certified mail so it can be tracked and you can prove it was delivered. Next slide. Okay, so we talked about how the program can actually replenish the security deposit and that's sort of tied into um, some executive orders that were issued by um, Governor Cuomo and, and we're going to um, we're going to look at, you know, how security deposit can be used towards the rent. So effective May 8th, 2020 through August 5th, 2020 due to multiple New York State executive orders issued by Governor Cuomo, tenants can use their security deposit to cover rent arrears or rent that will become due. Um, and we're gonna post the executive orders links to them in the chat. And so what does that mean? It means that if you borrow against the security deposit, um, you have to pay it back uh, over the course of a year. It would be added on to the rent um, at a rate of 1 12th per month. And you would start paying it back 90 days from the date that you borrow the security. Um, if you'd like to use your security, you have to provide consent to the landlord. Um, this can be done in writing. You should identify which month you would like the security applied to. And if you think that you need help with this type of request, you can always call FDC because we have help, we have help tenants um, you know, request that their security be used and we would be happy to help you um, with this. So next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it off to Jasmine right now. Hi everyone again. Um, so let's talk about how to apply for the COVID rent relief program. So um, the first step is to go to this web address, which we're going to put in the chat, don't worry. But um, it's hcr.ny.gov slash RRP. And at this link, tenants can, you know, go on this link to either apply online or to download a paper application. I will say that the best browsers to use to apply online is the Firefox browser and the Google Chrome browser. I don't know what's going on with Safari, but I do know that these two are definitely, you know, better browsers. Um, so the paper applications that you can download on this website are available in English, Spanish, Bengali, Chinese, Haitian, Creole, and Korean. And if you have any questions about how, how to navigate this site, you can contact the HCR call center at 833-499-0318. That number is also on the website. You know, they're very, you know, you know, explicit with the fact that you can call this number. And it's available from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Saturday. 
And, you know, if calling isn't really your thing, you can email HCR also at covidrentrelief at hcr.ny.gov. I do want to say that um, a lot of tenants who have already accessed this website, including me, have reported that it, you know, has been frozen or you get an error message. So, you know, just know that sometimes the first time that you access this web link, you know, it might be a little bit buggy. Um, so that's why you should really plan, you know, with this quick turnaround when the application is due, which again is July 30th. Um, you should definitely plan to be able to access this web link, you know, a few times, um, just anticipating that the first time or even the second time that you access it, it's not necessarily going to be, um, you know, in perfect shape. Um, next, please. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the actual application process for when you're online. So tenants who start that online application are going to be prompted to take an eligibility quiz. Um, you know, you're going to have very basic questions asking about your primary residence, um, if you're currently renting your primary residence. And um, as you go through this eligibility calculator, as you can see on the picture on the right, you know, the website's going to kind of suggest documents that you should have on hand. You see identity of primary adult resident, government issued identification required, you know, current lease or evidence of rent payments accepted, things like that. So just, you know, remember to have your documentation with you when you're applying, but also upload it onto your computer because the system's going to ask that you upload it into their portal. Um, also, in terms of this general application process, I do want to say that I'm not taking you through, you know, every single step that you're going to be prompted with when you take this application. Rather, I'm just focusing on specific parts of the application that I think are worth talking about that are chronological, but, you know, not step A, step B, step C. Um, and so once you get that eligibility calculator at the very bottom, you're going to get an apply for rent relief um you know thing and you basically press it and that's when you get started into the actual application so let's get started into the actual application um next please nina okay so when you're applying online you do have to have an ny.gov account if you don't have an ny.gov account no worries you can simply register um just you know scroll below and click do not have an account next please Okay, so to register an ny.gov account is honestly, you know, just as simple as if you've ever bought anything online or if you've ever authenticated a social media account, you basically create your own username and password along with, you know, specific security questions curtailed to you in order to register that ny.gov account. And then when you put in an email address associated with the account, you get a prompt to authenticate the email address. So it's very, very easy. Next, please. Okay, so after you've authenticated the account, you're going to actually start filling out the application. So the first thing to do, and this is right after you've you know, logged into your ny.gov account, whether or not you had it before, you had to register and now it's authenticated. The first thing you have to do is clarify who the application actually is for. I know, um, you know within a household, you might have one ny.gov account and have you know, a bunch of different benefits or whatever that applies to different people in your household. Um, that aren't necessarily applying for this rent relief application. So it's really important to clarify who this application is for, right? And then once you do that, you're going to be prompted with, you know, pretty easy questions. Where do you live? You know, what is your county? How many bedrooms do you have? You go through that and you enter in that information. Um, they're also going to ask you how much money you owe in the months that you owe the money for. Um, in this example, I just, you know, put 1000 and then, you know, I did it that they had owed money for April, May, June, and July. So that means that the tenant that I was, you know, pretending to be applying for would um, have to owe $4,000. Next, please. Okay. Um, the applications also, um, like Lisa said, there are eligibility requirements that um, of which an applicant has to have a United States citizen in the household or someone who has eligible immigration status. So this is just where they actually ask for you to prove that 
um, you have a citizen in your household or have someone with eligible immigration status and you use that, um, you prove that with your social security number or with the tax ID number. Next, please. Okay, um, the system is going to ask you to provide proof of your income on March 1st, 2020 and proof of your income now because like I said before and like Lisa said before, this is all about, you know, showing proof of lost income for the subsidy to apply to make you whole, right? So proof of income can be bank statements, checks, benefit letters, withdrawal history, and more. And tenants can drop and or upload files into this system that prove their income. Um, tenants are also going to be asked to give their landlord information, which is where the rent relief check will be sent. So, you know, once again, this is all very kind of basic things, but I just wanted to bring everyone's attention to the fact that these are questions that are going to be asked of you. Next, please. Oh, okay. So um, after you are also going to be asked to provide proof of your monthly rent amount by uploading either a lease or evidence of rent payments. Evidence of rent payments could be rent receipts you get from your landlord. It could be withdrawal history, you know, things like that. Um, if you do not have evidence of rent payments or a lease, you can select the I do not have this proof box. And after that, an attestation will load with information that you know you've already inputted into the system, stating your name and the monthly rent you know that you are assigned to have. And um, if the information in the attestation that loads is correct, then you can simply click the I agree box and press next. Next, please. Okay, so after submitting proof of your monthly rent, um, you've pretty much completed the application. The website is going to allow you to review all the information you inputted before submitting. So definitely make sure to keep an eye for that. Um, and before submitting the application, tenants have to sign the a statement attesting to the fact that the information they entered is true. Um, so, you know, just be aware of that. And after you've, you know, said that it's true, then you can press submit application at the bottom of the page. Next. Okay, so you filled out your application, you have submitted it. Um, so what comes next? So after a tenant has applied or been approved, a one-time payment is going to be sent directly to their landlord. HCR anticipates that they will send payments to landlords at the end of the summer. Um, and, you know, that's a little vague, but at least, you know, we have a little bit of a timeline. And in terms of when the payment is actually sent, the tenant and their landlord are going to be notified simultaneously. And, you know, if you get a notification that you've been approved and that the payment has sent, you should definitely save that notification as proof because it might be important later. Um, and then finally, tenants can just sign up for updates on the program. This is not an update on their individual application status, um, but you can sign up for updates here in the link in the presentation, which we will put in the chat. And that's really good because then, you know, we can anticipate that, you know, when it says HCR is gonna send payments at the end of the summer, that that's gonna be clarified further down the line. So that's why it's just really good to have um, these updates. So next, please. Um, I do wanna just give a little bit of a preface. So like I said before, we have Matthew Longobardi from Mobilization for Justice. Um, he's here, thank you so much for coming. He's going to talk about the eviction moratorium um, and what housing court is looking like right now. So thank you so much. And without further ado, I'm going to give the mic to Mr. Longobardi. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jasmine. And thank you, Lisa and, and Flatbush Development Corporation for inviting me to speak with you all tonight. Um, so Mobilization for Justice, we used to be known as MFY Legal Services. We're a nonprofit civil legal services organization and I'm a staff attorney in the housing project. So we help people who are facing eviction and also help tenants who um, facing other legal problems with their landlords, bad repair issues, harassment, and other issues with their Section 8, and a lot of, a lot of different issues. Um, so yeah, for, next slide, please, Nina. Um, 
So I was asked to talk about the eviction moratorium and I, I put in here what is or what was the eviction moratorium because um, it's, it's kind of changed a little bit over the course of the last few months, but it broadly means the New York state law and federal law that have prevented any evictions from going forward for the past, um, basically for the past four months. And you know when it started, the eviction moratorium also prevented the filing of new housing court cases and actually prevented housing court cases from going forward at all for, for a few months. So, you know, that was the, the initial version of the eviction moratorium that was put in place in New York um, in March, and it's, it's kind of gradually changed over the past few months. So, you know, the eviction moratorium only delays the eviction process. It does not, you know, cancel rent. It does not dismiss any currently pending cases, and it does not prevent landlords from bringing tenants to court in the future. It's, it's about stopping actual evictions from happening now and, and slowing down and stopping eviction cases from being filed. Next slide, please. So currently what's in place is um, a prohibition on any actual evictions from being uh, executed. Any, you know, the permission the landlord needs from a court to have a, a city marshal come to somebody's apartment and change the locks, those cannot happen right now. And that's going to be in place until at least August 5th. Um, you know, it's important to remember that New Yorkers can only be evicted with court process. They cannot be evicted um, illegally. Cannot the landlord cannot just ask a tenant to leave? Cannot um, change the locks themselves or, or cut off essential services? So that's the first thing that's really important. The court, you know, a court order is necessary for an eviction, and and only a, a city marshal or a sheriff. Can, can actually carry out an eviction. Um, so once the eviction moratorium ends, if it does end on August 5th, we don't know if it's gonna be extended any further. You know, the people that are at risk first are, are anybody who was in court before March 20th. Um, anybody who had a, a pending eviction case and, um, you know, who was gonna potentially be evicted in late March or early April is, is, is gonna be the first tenants who are at risk when the eviction moratorium, um, you know, ex when, it, when it eventually ends, if it, if it ends. The, you know, and I, I also just wanted to mention that even though we've had this eviction moratorium in place for a while now, it, it never did stop tenants from seeking their rights under the leases, such as to get repairs or to prevent landlords from doing illegal lockouts. So those, the housing court never stopped for those types of cases. And, um, you know, and it's gradually been reopening for certain pending cases that existed before March 20th, but um, really just for cases where tenants already had an attorney. And again, the, the final result of an eviction case, which is the actual physical changing of the locks, um, is not been permitted to happen since for the last four months. Next slide, please. So, I was also asked to present briefly on, on the CARES Act. So, you know, as everyone's aware, the CARES Act is a federal law that, um, you know, provided a lot of different relief to individuals uh, due to the coronavirus. But specifically for, for tenants, it does pretend, you know, protect certain tenants whose landlords have federal funding um, from carrying out eviction. So this is on top of the New York State protections that, that I've mainly been discussing so far. The, you know, so who, what types of landlords are subject to this? You know, any landlord who, who might receive section eight, that includes um, any like NYCHA land, you know, if NYCHA is your landlord, um, landlords with other types of federal funding or, or federally backed mortgages. Um, and basically the CARES Act prohibited those types of landlords from going forward with evictions until basically till tomorrow. Um, when the CARES Act sort of starts to expire with respect to the CARES Act eviction moratorium. And then after tomorrow, those landlords are supposed to serve a 30 day notice on their tenants uh, uh, if they're seeking an eviction. So the, the, the moratorium ends tomorrow, but the, that starts the process of the 30 day notices. So really the earliest a CARES Act landlord could, um, could evict a tenant is August 25th. And that's you know assuming the New York state moratorium expires on August 5th. The, you know, this moratorium is a little bit broader than some people know, and, and we think a lot of landlords are probably not going to comply with these requirements that, that are subject to the moratorium. So, you know, it's, in, 
important to look up your landlord on, you know, on this website that I think hopefully somebody can place it in the chat. Um, and, you know, you can search by zip code to see if your address is on there. If you are on there, you know, it might be worth talking to an attorney about your, about your rights um, because they might be a little bit different than other tenants whose landlords might not be subject to the CARES Act. Next slide. So, um, you know, again, I said the, the moratorium has been shifting. So since for the last month, since June 22nd, landlords have been permitted to file new cases in housing court, except if they were um, covered by the CARES Act and following that law, um, you know, but it's important to remember that landlords can only start a housing court case if they first serve a tenant with a notice saying that they're gonna bring them to housing court um, if the tenant doesn't comply with certain obligations. So for the non-payment of rent, if for, for cases where tenants behind on, on their rent, the landlord has to first um, serve a few different notices. Uh, there's often, you know, landlords may um, serve a letter via certi you know, possibly by certified mail, which is just informing the tenant that rent is late. This is a new requirement from the state law, the HSTPA, the Housing Stability Tenant Protection Act of 2019 which basically is just designed to make sure that tenants rent is not lost in the mail. So if, if you get, get a letter from your landlord saying your rent is five days late, that might just be this notice um, under the HSTPA that requires notification that, you're, that the landlord didn't receive your rent. So that's one notice tenants might receive if they're behind on their rent. But the, the really significant notice I think before getting brought to housing court is the rent demand. And so that's currently a 14 day notice the tenants have to, you know, that landlords have to serve on a tenant and have to be in person now since, since the HSTPA has to be done in person. Like they have to, somebody has to come to your door and try to hand this notice to you. And if, if they're not there, if you're not there, they have to come back another time and then they can put it on your door and also mail copies to you. Um, but if you get this notice anyway, whether it's in the mail or on your door or under your door or somebody comes to you in person, it's got to give you 14 days to to pay your rent or the landlord's gonna bring you to court. So that's the first notice you have to receive um, before the landlord can even, even start filing a case in court. And there may be other notices you'd receive as well from your landlord, you know, and it's important to, you know, if you get any notices that you're concerned about, talk to a housing advocate, talk to somebody at Flatbush Development Corporation or call Mobilization for Justice or another nonprofit legal services office to talk about the notices you've received. Next slide, please. Um, so after, if tenants do get those predicate notices, and, and I should say that there's different notices for other types of housing court cases. So certain cases, um, you know, there's non-payment cases for non-payment of rent, but there's also other types of cases, breach of lease or the lease is expired. Those, um, those also require certain notices, but they might have different time periods than the 14 day rent demand notice. Um, so after the land, after the time expires, after the 14 days to, for, to pay the rent or go to court, the landlord then has to file in housing court and go um, and, and then serve the, te the tenant with additional court paperwork, basically informing the tenant that a case has been filed in housing court. The, um, those papers, again, have to be served in person. Somebody has to come to your door, knock on your door, and, and, try to, and try to serve you personally. So it's really important to, to kind of take note of how you get any notices from your landlord, because that could give you additional defenses when you eventually, if you eventually get to housing court. Um, as of right now, you know, tenants are gonna be permitted to call the court, to, to tell the court of their defenses, and you might probably will not have to go to court right away um, because you know, courts are still basically closed to in-person traffic as much as possible. And, and what the goal is for now is to try to connect as many tenants as possible with attorneys. And, and then us attorneys, we appear in court usually via Skype for the, for the time being. Um, until at least August 5th, you know, tenants also have extra time to reply to any notices they receive from their landlord. So you, know, you may get a notice saying you have extra time to respond to the, to the court papers as well. And again, it, you know, it's really important to talk to an attorney or a housing advocate about any paperwork you receive. Next slide, please. So, you know, once tenants get to court, they're gonna have, people are gonna have defenses to some of the allegations landlords raise. I mean, one defense might be, I need more time for the, the rent relief program to come through, or I need more time to potentially get a one-shot deal or, or, or other things like that. But there's also the, the New York State Tenant Safe Harbor Act, which is 
provides a, an, a new defense for tenants, um, which you know tenants have to raise this defense themselves. It's, it's something that you're gonna a tenant's gonna have the obligation of of proving that they're entitled to this defense. But if they make out the defense, if you can convince the judge that you are covered by this law, the landlord can't evict you even if you owe rent from the COVID-19 period. Um, you know, so the, the, it's it's kind of a mixed bag, the, the new law. It, it, you know, has some good protections for tenants if they can prove it, but it's gonna be difficult for tenants to prove this. And so you have to kind of arm yourself with some documentation um, in order to prove it, to prove that you were financially, you know, suffered a financial hardship because of COVID-19. And so some of the proof that you would need to make out the financial hardship is kind of a lot of the same types of information that Jasmine was just going over with the application for the rent relief project. It's gonna be based on your income before COVID, it's gonna be based on your income during COVID, and it's gonna be based on like, you know, whether you have any assets or other ways to show whether you are actually suffered a hardship from COVID-19. But if you did suffer a hardship, you can't um, be evicted even if you owe rent. The, you know, the landlord can only get a money judgment. And so a money judgment still is not a great outcome for, for tenants because you know, that does mean it could impact your credit. It, the landlord could eventually garnish any wages or assets for you, but it could provide a defense to prevent you from being evicted, losing your apartment um, during this pandemic. You know, the only thing, the only catch is that we, it's a new law. We don't know exactly how judges are gonna be applying it yet. So, next slide. And um, yeah, and so, you know, Mobilization for Justice, where I work, we have a hotline. It's open, currently it's open every day, Monday through Friday, um, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So that's the number is there, 212-417-3888. You can be connected with an attorney um, or a housing advocate to talk about your problems. And, you know, I think the issues that we're helping the most people with right now are, you know, people that are getting notices from their landlords could be facing an eviction case, especially if you had an eviction case previously to COVID and you didn't have an attorney for it, you might wanna really connect with an attorney as soon as possible right now. And then, you know, also we can help with illegal lockouts or, or really bad repair issues, harassment, things like that, that tenants might be facing um, either due to COVID or, you know, in the future because of, you know, we help tenants all the time. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to the next presenter. Um, and there'll be time to answer some questions at the end. Awesome, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Sam Yang, I'm the housing liaison at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Commission on Human Rights, we are a city agency that enforces the anti-discrimination law. So the law prohibits discrimination, unfair treatment, unequal treatment of a person or a group based on certain characteristics or memberships in a protected class, such as age, race, uh, national origin, immigration status. Um, we prohibit discrimination in employment, in housing, public accommodations, discriminatory harassment, as well as bias-based profiling by law enforcement. So today we're mainly gonna discuss about housing protection, right? So with the current pandemic, with COVID-19, you still have all the rights that is granted to you prior to COVID. So when it comes to the human rights law, um, you cannot, you have the right to live in your house, uh, in your units, free from harassment, free from intimidation, free from being threatened by your landlord because of your identity. So uh, examples would be a landlord can say, because of your race, we don't want you in this apartment anymore, you must leave. They cannot make statements such as that um, you are an essential employee, you work in a grocery store, or you work in the hospital, and because of your contact or possible contacts with individuals with COVID, um, you may cause a harm to you know, this apartment complex and wishes for you to leave or refuse to rent out this apartment to you. Those are all still prohibited and not allowed. Um, so what the Commission of Human Rights have deemed is that we deem that any illness related to COVID-19 is a form of disability. And our definition of disability is any medical, mental, psychological, or physical uh, impairment or history of impairment. Um, and so it's very general and it's very broad. 
So the illnesses with COVID-19, um, we deem as a disability. And in housing, one of the great things is that um, you have the right for reasonable accommodation and housing. Reasonable accommodation meaning that you have the right to have a collaborative dialogue with your landlord and request for them to accommodate your living situation so that, you're, so that you are able to live comfortably and safely in your own house, in your apartment. Um, as well, of course, following the laws when it comes to quarantine. Um, also, in the event if you are high risk um, based on CDC, meaning that if you're an individual with a medical condition and you're high risk of um, getting serious illnesses from COVID or being seriously ill because of COVID, you are also deemed and allowed to have reasonable accommodation. Um, so for reasonable accommodation examples would be that if you are currently quarantined um, and you are not allowed to go downstairs into your lobby, right? Or if you are currently, you have type two diabetes and you know, catching COVID will cause serious illness. So you can't go down to your lobby. You prefer to stay home in the comforts of your own space. Um, you order some sort of takeout food, right? Which is pretty fine. Um, and your building has a policy that states that, oh, um, we do not allow anyone from the outside who is not resident to come in. So in this instance, obviously there is a situation where if you are not allowed to leave your apartment, you will most likely not be able to pick up that food. So in that instance, that is prohibited, that is not allowed. The landlord should accommodate the tenants. They should come up with such policies as in um, hiring another staff to bring the food up into your apartment or allowing that person to temporarily go up into the buildings and deliver that food straight to your apartment. Um, so, as I mentioned, with disability, you have to write for reasonable accommodation. Um, and when we say reasonable, we really mean that as long as the accommodation does not cause an undue hardship to the landlord. Um, and undue hardship has to be proven by the landlord. So the landlord has to prove to us why in the instance that they are not able to hire a third person to bring up the food why in the instance they can't allow uh, a delivery personnel to bring up food into your doorsteps. They will have to prove that it causes them an undue hardship. Basically that it's too much of a financial burden, they will bankrupt from it, or that um, it's just not feasible, it's just not possible because of safety concerns, right? Um, so the other thing with this is that, as we know that, um, when it comes to disabilities and when someone does try to get in contact with the landlord over it, they are on a basis where landlords do ignore them or they don't get response back. Right? In those instances, please do contact the Commission Human Rights. You could reach us by calling 311 or you could contact us by calling our hotline number, which is 212-416-0197. Um, we are a city agency, so we do provide in different languages. So if you call us, and you need Chinese, um, we have Chinese interpretations. If you need Spanish, we have Spanish interpretations. Um, most languages, we will have interpretation uh, allow, uh, available to assist. So don't be afraid. Um, we do not ask about immigration status, so don't be worried about that as well. Um, and again, um, so the city commission, we really wanna make sure that during this time period, especially when it's a danger sometimes to be outside that we hope individuals are able to stay and live comfortably in their own house, right? Um, it's the sanctuary. Your apartment, your unit is your sanctuary. It's where you are able to uh, be comfortable, be you. And in no instance, you ever be intimidated or harassed. If you are being harassed, if your landlord, not just on COVID, but if your landlord is threatening you to taking you to court on non-payment, um, but at the same time, call, demeaning you, you know, calling you illegal alien, demeaning you, using racial slurs, um, using improper gender pronouns as other forms of harassment and intimidation to make you leave the premise on yourself without going to court. That is illegal. That is not allowed. That is prohibited. Do file complaint with the commission. Um, the maximum penalty for willful and malicious uh, when wanton. Uh, is $250,000. So if a landlord is harassing you, intimidating you, they could be penalized of up to $250,000 per instance of discrimination. Um, this money the city takes, so that's the bad thing. 
Yeah. Uh, but on the positive side is that um, individuals who do file complaints might be able to receive punitive damages, emotional damages, um, as well as the changes of policy necessary to make sure that you're able to reside in your um, apartments and units company. Um, yeah, so again, um, you still have all the rights granted to you prior to COVID-19. In fact, you have more rights as of now. We have actually created a COVID-19 uh, unit, a unit specifically deal to deal with this instance. Um, we have a unit specifically built so that in the event if someone is getting discriminated because of COVID-19 or illnesses associated to COVID-19, um, we are able to intervene. Instead of going through court, which might take a long time period, we will try our best to intervene these in two days or three days as soon as possible to help resolve this uh, issue with the landlord. So please do call us at 311 uh, and say you want to speak with the Commission of Human Rights or our hotline number at 212-416-0197. Next. Next. Okay, thank you so much, Sam, and thank you so much, Matt, for um, you know giving us those contacts of other current protections for tenants. Um, I think by now you guys should probably be COVID rent relief experts. If you're not, it's totally my fault. It's okay. Um, but I think in terms of you know when we're outlining the eligibility measures for that COVID rent relief program and talking about how to, it would actually shake out in terms of you being approved and you know a delayed kind of payment that the landlord receives that's at the end of the summer very vague you know there's a lot of people who are cut out of that rent relief program you know if you live in public housing if you have a section 8 voucher you're cut out right if you don't have somebody in the household who has eligible um, immigration status or is a u.s citizen you're cut out and you know, that's totally fine. You know, this is a program that is, I think, in everybody's point of view, you know, not meant to be the end all be all. But um, I just want to draw everyone's attention to these three really great bills that have been proposed right now in the New York State Senate, which I think are a lot more comprehensive than the rent relief program and, you know, are definitely worthy of attention. So in terms of who created these bills, it was a part of the Housing Justice for All Coalition and the Right to Counsel Coalition. Both um, coalitions come, are consistent, consisting of um, New York State tenant organization groups, um, you know, all upstate and all up downstate. And they've gotten together and written these three really great bills that, um, you know, I think would be very important if they're passed. So, the first bill is the Emergency Housing Stability and Displacement Prevention Act. That code is S8667. So basically it puts in place a universal eviction moratorium for residential and commercial tenants. That would begin on March 7, 2020 to the duration of the crisis plus one year. So this proposal is real, you know, substantive relief that is you know, kind of on the table that until now, I don't think any of the project protections that we discussed, um, you know, cover. Um, this bill would also prevent landlords from filing all eviction cases in court, which is very important. Unfortunately, our current eviction moratorium does not cover that, but this bill would. We are also proposing the Rent and Mortgage Cancellation Act of 2020. Those bill codes are A10826. It also has the code for S08802. And that cancels rent for all residential tenants and mortgages for small homeowners from March 7th, 2020 to the end of the crisis plus 90 days. So, I mean, that's probably one of my favorite bills because I would love for rent to be canceled. Um, and it also um, outlines that for-profit landlords will be able to apply for a hardship program. So, you know, rather than just having a COVID rent relief program where, you know, let's say a landlord has four buildings and all the tenants within the four buildings have to apply individually, you know, submitting different information that has a huge margin of error. Instead of that, there would just be one landlord applying for a hardship program that would apply to all of his buildings and all, or her buildings and all of the tenants in his or her buildings. So, you know, I, I love this proposal because it really is focused towards comprehensive relief. 
Um, this bill is also going to create an assistance program for public housing co-ops that lose maintenance fees and affordable housing operators. So a focus on public housing that the COVID rate relief program does not address. Um, and if landlords are found to be in violation of these bill protections, they can suffer fines, which I personally love that there's consequences for, um, you know, messing with or interfering maliciously or not on tenants' livelihoods. Next, please. So the third and final bill is the Housing Access Voucher Program. That code is 7628A. It's a statewide voucher program that's gonna include all income eligible residents, including undocumented folks, and um, will cover units at market rate. So I think the COVID rent relief program and other programs you know, that we've seen before are very much targeting people who are, um, you know, who make a certain level of income in relation to the area median income. And it usually has to be pretty low. And while that does definitely take in a lot of people, that does, um, you know, it, it leaves a lot of other people in the cold. So I really like this voucher program because it's going to encompass everybody um, and especially undocumented folks. I think that's a very, very important part of this bill. So half of these vouchers are gonna go to folks in the shelter or the street. Um, and the other half are gonna go to those who are chronically housing insecure and if funded properly, this program can dramatically reduce the shelter population and ease the rent burden for thousands of tenants. So I have a, um, you know, right here, tenants can follow the progress of all these three bills online. You can see that it's been filed. You know, you can see that people are thinking of voting on it all out here in the advanced legislative search button, which we're gonna put in the chat. Um, next, please. And for these three bills, if there's anything that I said that sounds really interesting, of which it should be, because when we all love for our rent to be canceled, when we all love for, you know, public housing to be included in our protections, because they are also New Yorkers and they are also tenants. Um, so if you are really into what I'm saying here, then you should contact your state representatives to ask that they sponsor and pass these three bills. Specifically, you should go to bit.ly slash eviction free and why we'll also put that in the chat. Don't worry. And that's going to direct you on how to call email and tweet at your electeds. They already have a phone script all, you know, ready for you. So you really don't have to do anything but put your name, your address where you live, because that, you know, is going to pertain that's going to focus you to certain electeds based on, you know, your district. And, um, you know, once you call, email, and tweet, you should definitely get your family, neighbors, and friends to call, email, and tweet, because this is really how we put forth change that works for everybody. You know, I'm really happy that the COVID rent relief program is here, and it's definitely something that, like, my own family is going to use, but these three bills really get at, you know, everyone. Um, and so if you're interested in getting involved with ensuring protections for you and your neighbors, if you're interested in learning more about the COVID rent relief program, using your security deposit to know more, to apply it to current rent or arrears, interested in knowing more about the eviction moratorium or the human rights, you know, state, the human rights city laws, New York City human rights laws, and you should definitely contact the Blackfish Development Corporation for more information and we'll definitely you know, if we can't answer your question, we'll definitely connect you to the people who can. Next, please. So without any further ado, that's the end of our, um, you know, presentation. Um, we're going to take some questions right now. It's 7.35, so we actually made some great time. We have the Zoom session until 8, 8 p.m. Um, you know, if there's not that many questions, we might end early. So if there's anything that you, you know, are curious about that you're not able to answer right now, definitely email us at housing at fdconline.org or call us at 718-859-3800, extension 210. Thank you so much, Sam, Matt, and Lisa for presenting with me today. And um, without further ado, we're gonna get to the question and answer session. So Lisa and I are gonna kind of take the questions um, kind of one by one, you know, I guess, Lisa, if you want to go first, you can go first. And then for the questions that are specifically about the human rights law, the eviction moratorium, or anything that seems a little bit more, you know, legally, um, we might, um, you know, kick it to Matt and Sam, but 
the first question that we have right now for you to answer, Lisa, is, um, or I guess this actually is probably going to go towards Sam. How does the New York City Commission on Human Rights use cease and desist letters? And can you give us an example? Sure. Oh, I'm still on. Sure. So we've um, always been using cease and desist letters. It's kind of like a warning letter to inform the landlords uh, or the businesses or the violators to inform them that um, whatever conduct that they're currently doing is uh, illegal, it's not allowed. So in a landlord and tenant situation, usually if the landlord is harassing the tenant using some sort of derogatory comments toward the tenant, we send a letter telling them that they have to stop these type of comments because it's causing a hostile living condition. Um, the letters is just a warning, basically saying that if you don't stop, if you don't stop, we will start uh, legal procedures. Um, and if we do a legal procedure, then there might be civil penalties, which as I mentioned earlier, the civil penalties is up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars So this is a quarter of a million dollars. Sam, I have another question. This is Lisa. Um, can you give us an example of um, a reasonable accommodation as a policy change and a reasonable accommodation as a structural change in housing? Sure. Um, so uh, example reasonable accommodation for policy that we get a lot is no pet policies in buildings. So particularly right now, um, as always, if someone has an emotional support animal or is in need of emotional support animal, um, as long as the individual is able to provide uh, documentation showing that they need the emotions per animal, they, sh they are allowed to bring the animal into buildings despite the no pet policies. So that would be the policy change. Um, with a structural change, if a person you know, is using a wheelchair or, um, and the building doesn't have a ramp, a uh, structural change would be building a ramp um, or widening the doors into the entrance. Um, if they have carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, changing the style of doorknob so it's easier for individuals with carpal tunnel syndrome to um, open the doors. Um, and as always, uh, with reasonable accommodation, the landlord is responsible to paying for all of that accommodation. They cannot pass the bill on to the tenant. Um, and if you if you suddenly see like your rent does increase because you ask for accommodation, receive that accommodation, you find with the tenant because the form of retaliation, discrimination. Okay, thank you. Um, so for Lisa, if you wanna answer this next question, it's, is eligibility for the rent relief program based on your earnings from your last W-2? Um, that is something that I would have to is eligibility based on your earnings from your last W-2? I'm gonna say probably not, um, but I'm gonna to have to look into that question. Um, so if the person who posted that question, can you provide us with your email address or your telephone number so that we can get back to you? Can you post it, um, I guess, in the chat? You can also contact us at housing at fdconline.org or 718-859-3800 extension 210. Um, the next question is people who are getting unemployment, do they get the service? Yes, um, you can use the service if you're getting income from unemployment. Um, another question is, um, sorry, someone also asked another question about unemployment, which we just answered. That's okay. Uh -huh. the, um, the next question is, do you have to pay this back? Um, and the answer is, no, you do not have to pay this back. I, I'm presuming that you're referring to the COVID rent relief program. No, you do not have to pay it back, thankfully. <laughs> but if you borrow against your security, you do have to pay that back. So the next question is, what kind of help or relief are available for homeowners? So the COVID rent relief program is unfortunately not um, focused on homeowners. However, um, one of the protections that I talked about at the end, um, the um, it, I think it's the second bill, that one specifically targets homeowners. Um, 
And in terms, homeowners can also apply um, for hardship if they're, is, if they're delayed on their mortgage payments. Um, I think you can defer those, or not delayed, if you're unable to, or if you have issues paying your mortgage, they can apply for hardship. I do not actually know that specific process, but I do know that that's available. And if anybody knows more, because I see you nodding your head, Matt, um, then feel free to jump in. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, the cancel rent bill also does um, provide protection for mortgages and, and does have some other protections for homeowners. Mobilization for Justice also has a foreclosure prevention project that does um, provide services to low income um, homeowners and advice to I can um, I can get that phone number and put that in the chat or hopefully somebody can put it in the chat for us. Um, the next question is, I guess, for Lisa, will it affect your immigration status, this rent relief? Okay, that is a great question. Um, anytime you have questions about applying for benefits and how it will affect your immigration status, you can contact the New York City Mayor's Office for Immigrant Affairs. Um, I, we're going to post the phone number so that everyone can see this. It's a really great resource um, to answer these questions, and we'll post that um, right now. Um, another question, I guess, for me to answer is, can you apply if you're retired and receiving Social Security? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Lisa. The question is, are you, can you apply if you're retired and receiving Social Security? Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think retirement income or social security income, is that included in this benefit? I mean, I wanna say that if you lost some type of income during the time, I mean, I don't know, you could get social security in certain situations and also work. Um, and so if you lost your employment, um, I wanna say that you probably would. Um, you know, again, this is a very new program. So these are the first time, you know, this is the first time we're getting these questions. Um, but I'm gonna say yes, if you lost income, then yes. Okay. And you can uh, also always, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jazz, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you can also always call the HCR hotline um, to answer some of these questions, or you can give us your email address and we'll get back to you. Um, one of the questions is, um, hmm. Someone says, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I can keep up with things. Um, I saw a question saying that what happens if you got paperwork before the pandemic? I don't, um, unfortunately, I don't know what that is referring to, but if you got court papers before the pandemic, as Matt said, yes, you are, um, you know, more vulnerable compared to people who you know, haven't had any type of court case started before the pandemic. Um, I, I don't know if, I don't really know what paperwork means other than that, unfortunately. And if you want to clarify, feel free to put into the chat. You can email us at housing at fdconline.org, 718-859-3800, extension 210. Um, that might be it for the questions. Um, Last thing, um, in terms of the paperwork, you know, if paperwork was received um, before the pandemic, Matt, can you talk about, um, you know, if eviction notices were issued before the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, so like I said, there's a lot of different types of notices that tenants will receive in the course of an eviction case. Um, and the, the, the last notice before an eviction takes place is the notice of eviction from a city marshal. So those notices will have to be re-served if it, even if it was served prior to the um, eviction moratorium, because those notices, if they, if they don't, um, aren't used within 30 days, they expire basically. So the, the marshal will have to serve a new notice after August 5th. For other notices that tenants might've received before the, before the eviction moratorium, some of them might not have to be reserved, but the court may send a postcard or something along those lines to notify tenants that their case is now gonna move forward. Um, or landlords may serve updated paperwork to account for kind of the changes in the law and the changes in the, in the circumstances over the past few months. So you, you might get new notices, but if you got any sort of notice, whether it's before COVID or since, I think it's a really good time to talk to, whether it's FDC or, 
uh, or calling Mobilization for Justice or another nonprofit legal services organization because you know it's it's there's a lot of different notices, a lot of different time limits for those types of notices. It's really important to you know get those scanned or, or take a picture of them and, and get them over to a housing advocate to to really understand what your you know what you should do in response to the notice. Okay, so um, I mean, I guess, I don't know if there's any more questions. It seems like there is not, um, but basically, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope you guys learned a little bit about the COVID rent relief program and a little bit extra because at FDC, we like to be a little bit extra. Um, so if you ever wanna contact us, um, you can contact us at housing at fdconline.org. Um, or you can call us at 718-859-3800, um, extension 210. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, we don't really have anything else unless anybody else has something that they'd like to say. And thank you so much, Sam and Matt, for um, joining us today. And thank you for everybody who's watching. And we hope that we taught you something, but also made you smile. Nothing else? Okay, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your night and that you stay dry. Thank you. <laughs>